Good afternoon and welcome to Tent Abacus on day four of MCH 2022. We are still waiting for one of our speakers. He will be here any minute, second, week, day from now. Um, while we are here, um, who of you is, uh, is attending a hacker camp for the first time? Can I have a show of hands? Awesome. Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Woohoo! Excellent. Have you signed up for it? Who has signed up for an angel shift yet? Show of hands, come on. Oh, come on, there should be more. There's still time to do. So please, please, please do sign up as an angel. It's very simple. You get wonderful, beautiful t-shirts. You get a warm meal for it. And if you're picking up one of the highly exclusive trash, um, trash shifts, you even get a physical badge for, for your efforts. So please, please do sign up as an angel. We need, we need more of those and uh, um, um, need any help that we can. Also, if you want to stay for teardown, you will get a, a meal, uh, you will get fed, you will get uh, water, and you will get a warm, warm feeling of helping us um, clean up the event afterwards. So, everyone's sleeping on the, on the premises, right? No, no hotel guests. No, everyone's. So, hands, show of hands, who has been bitten by a mosquito yet? <laughs> okay, uh, more than one bite? Hand, show of hands, more than five hands? More than five bites? Ah, come on. Where are you all the time? In the tent? <laughs> well, um, from what I heard, our speakers almost there, we're just verifying the last few details, and then we should get going. Um, yeah, I, I think I don't have to defragment. It's still good, still places, still seats available. Right. Yeah, come up. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, if, you, if you have uh, pre-ordered merch, please pick it up at the merch shop over there, um, because otherwise it would get sold to somebody else who hasn't pre-ordered. I mean, they are probably happy about it, but you won't. Um, also, uh, unfortunately, there's no seating on, the, sitting on the floor, even at the back, so please find yourself a chair. There's plenty available, even up at the front with a good sight of everyone. Um, do I have, do I have any, any more talking points? Let me guess. To apply sunscreen so the, the rain is, 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 is uh, dropping off your body more easily. That's also a good idea. Hmm? Yeah. The building up with the gator, and the gator is there. He's gone. So. Um. Do you have? No, no, no. It's it's good. It's good. It's good. Okay. It's always fun when the speaker shows up a little bit late. <laughs> but we're, we're, he, gets, he, gets, he gets cabled up, so we are ready to go. Hooray! <laughs> Woo -hoo! Hi, man. So, without further ado, um, as you prop, as you, no. Hello and welcome to MCH 2022. This is day four, this is Tent Abacus. As you probably have noticed, um, when the politics um, decided that the pandemic is over, <clears throat> yeah, good joke, um, there also a, a war started in Europe's backyard. Um, and for the first time, um, cyber 
in what several forms also played a major part. To introduce you to the panel that will discuss uh, all these topics, I will hand this over to Kirill. So please give Kirill and his panel a very warm round of applause. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, it's been a nine-year-old nine war, nine-year-long war. But uh, it's been a full-on hell in Ukraine for full five months yesterday. That's five months and one day since the renewed invasion of Ukraine already. Uh, this is a, an important topic. This is not a not a fun topic, but it has, to, it has to be discussed. We're here today to take 90 minutes of your time and discuss it from the cyber perspective, but also, of course, we cannot forget the sacrifice, the lives being given as well on the battlefield. Uh, here today with me is uh, Peter van den Howell, security analyst from Saxion, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, we have also Chris Kubeka, who is uh, CEO and founder of Hypersec Netherlands and distinguished chair for the Middle East Institute of Cybersecurity and Emerging Technology program. And remotely, we have uh, Anastasia Vaitova, who is head of customer solutions, uh, security engineer at Cossack Lab. She's joining us live from Ukraine. Welcome, yes. So I want to start, and, and, and thank you so much, Anastasia, especially to you for joining us, uh, since uh, I know it's, it's, it's very much to do, right? Supporters from, from um, outside Ukraine, many of us here are supporters of Ukraine that are, we are not in Ukraine. Uh, we have the uh, privilege of taking a day off or, or, or a week off. People in Ukraine don't have that. They have to work every day to keep their uh, country safe and secure. So. I'd like to start with you, Anastasi. Uh, since this is a nine-year-long war already, I want to just bring everyone up to speed and, and, and just go back in time a bit here and talk about 2013. How did you perceive 2014? What was your initial reaction? Well, in 2014, I was 24. I got my master's degree in software engineering and I was already working, right? So I was not expecting the war. And suddenly my whole career afterwards, it was all related to the war, right? So as a young professional, as someone who works in the software, I didn't have a chance to enjoy a peaceful life at all. And I didn't give I'm not in Kiev right now, but I live in Kiev, in the capital of Ukraine. And since 2014, we got really a lot of people moving from the east parts of Ukraine to Kiev, to capital, people rebuilding their lives, right? And a lot of my colleagues are from the east parts of Ukraine. And that war in 2014, in effect, it affected everyone, even if the shelling were located in the east. It was felt every, everywhere across Ukraine. Um, what, about, what about you personally? Um, would you be willing to share um, some examples from your personal life, how that affected you? I don't even know how you feel about um, young woman, like instead of buying dresses and things like that, I was buying military equipment because in 2014 we already have the strong volunteer movement and I was buying a lot of things I never thought I would be buying and I got up to speed with all this shooting, with first aid, with anti terrorist but what to do in case of terrorist attacks and things like that. So I just, you know, um, personally, I think most part of my conscious adult life is connected with the war in one way or another. 
Right, and I remember after a couple of years living in Ukraine, I went to uh, Litva, I guess, and I seen fireworks, and I was super scared. And again, I was living in Kiev, in the capital, so without all the shellings. But right now, in 2022, I don't know if I will be enjoying fireworks ever in my life. Like, ever. Because I don't like loud sounds. There was a thunderstorm here two days ago, and it was quite scary because of the sounds. So yeah, personally, I think all Ukrainians are affected since 2014, and you're right, this is ninth year, and right now it's uh, five months and one day of the full-scale invasion. We calculate every day. Thank you. Um, the cyber front was also not static for the past nine years. Uh, cyber activities were there from 2014 onwards. So uh, I'd like the panelists to chime in on, uh, chime in on NotPetya, Black Energy, all the other activities that the Russian hackers were conducting. Um, if, if we could start by outlining what it is. I'm sure that nine years is a long time for for some of you, some of you are, are around 18 here, right? So um, you may not be aware of the attacks. Maybe we can have a panelist that can outline that. Uh, Anastasia, would you be able to do that for us? Just a couple of words about uh, what NotPetya is, technically, what uh, Black Energy. Yeah, this are one of the named cyber attacks to the critical infrastructure in Ukraine and then over the world. Uh, these are only ones, I, I mean, I'm sure there were more of them, but these examples are well um, studied and there are books about them, there are Wikipedia articles, basically Black Energy and then later Petya, not Petya, uh, like a critical infrastructure, malware kind of things that affected first uh, critical infrastructure in Ukraine, especially black energy, we had some kind of blackouts, like brownouts, how we call it. And then um, Petya not Petya has affected a lot of enterprise companies all around the world. I think if you don't know about that, I really, really recommend you reading uh, a book about Sandworm. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting how uh, um not Petya initially masqueraded as a ransomware, right? But it turned out to be a government malware, destructive malware, that they had no intention of collecting uh, any money from the victims. They just wanted to damage certain sectors in Ukraine. Um, Peter, uh, may I ask you to tell us briefly uh, about your life before the 24th of uh, February? How far do you want to go from that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, let me start first for where my journey regarding Ukraine uh, began. Um, I think it's already 2013, the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, um, where you see courageous young people taking faith into their own hands and um, go out for a protest against their, at that moment, current president who has to sign an uh, association agreement with the European Union. Um, I was touched by that. Um, you see young people fighting for something that we here in, uh, in the rest of Europe take for granted, and that is freedom, and that is destination, uh, and that is um, more or less fair leadership, uh, democracy, which wasn't the case uh, back in 2014 in Ukraine. Um, so I was touched by that, and um, yeah, I started digging into what is going on there, because I have to be honest, I knew little about Ukraine. Uh, only the fact that we had a foundation in our small village that take foster children over for the summer vacation and stuff like that. Um, but that's it, that's all I knew about Ukraine. Um, now then, of course, in 2014, um, a really terrible disaster uh, hit Dutch society as well. Uh, 298 people died in a really coward action of what I consider to be, uh, yeah, it's clear, really clear that the Russian army was um, behind this attack. Um, and 
yeah, of course there is a rage inside you and, and, and you know already that there is a war going on, but now it comes really close. Uh, it just starts getting innocent people and that yeah, are just flying over a country. So that's a fear to rage. And um, yeah, then you see in 2015, 2016, uh, discussed it with Chris as well, an, an, an uprise of what I call a pro-Russian narrative on what I think this doesn't fit into Dutch society. You see certain movements within Dutch society uh, getting fueled up. You see a certain narrative getting into the media. And that's for me where I started to get to dig into this and get into dig into this topic. Uh, what actors are involved? Uh, how do they hold up to each other? And then in 2016, we had the referendum in the Netherlands about the association agreement in Ukraine. Um, yeah, from that moment on, um, I was actively involved with uh, a couple of other people uh, gathering information about certain things that happen here. Um, and yeah, and, till now I'm involved in that kind of uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, um, yeah, and since 2018, and that's where I met Anastasia as well, uh, I'm attending to the No Name Kong conference in Ukraine. Uh, because I have a strong belief that uh, we should at fo foremost, and even back then, support Ukraine on the pathway uh, getting into the European Union. And uh, from a cyber atmosphere, I try to yeah, be kind of like an ambassador, or whatever you want to call it, uh, but intermediary uh, to, 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 to make the community here and there aware of each other and of each other's capabilities. And yeah. That's in a short brief until... Uh... Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. We'll, we'll certainly take uh, a minute near the end of the panel to talk about uh, EU, uh, Ukraine cooperation, and NATO, um, Ukraine cooperation as well. Uh, but to move on talking about the cyber front, we first need to answer a really simple question. Anastasia, I'd like to ask you the question, So, because uh, you are the best person to answer that. How digitalized is Ukraine? Because many people aren't aware. Do, do you have digital services? How advanced they are? How long have you had them? Oh, actually, it's a good test uh, for Ukrainians because many people, um, like, you know, since 2017, I guess, Ukrainians can go visa-free to Schengen area and many countries of European Union, so they, could, they can compare really easily. And a lot of feedback, what they have, what I hear is that Ukrainian digital services are really, really sophisticated compared to some countries in European Union. So we have everything digitalized. Okay, not everything, not maybe the level of Estonia, but a lot of things are digital. Uh, we do have this DIA application. You probably heard about that. This is a mega application of Ukrainian government that allows to have in one application your ID, like a passport ID, your driver license, your COVID certificate. Uh, recently, they start doing e-voting kind of polls in this application, asking people uh, opinion on guns control and things like that, right? So this is the main application that uh, allows you to, uh, to move in Ukraine without your ID card or without your passport, because you have a mobile app for that. Um, then we do have all banks have uh, their applications and things like like Venmo, kinda, things are very popular. So you can send money to other people accounts in, in a blink of an eye, right? It takes like seconds, literally. Uh, applications like Monobank allow you to get together, shake your app and send money. Again, it's, it's not like a, some kind of new things. They're just super spread out. Right in many many shops, uh, you can uh, you can pay with a pay pass. So I just use typically I use my Apple Watch, and this is all I need to pay for something. Uh, all the tickets, everything can be bought online. So typically you don't need to have you know a lot of papers with you. And I I read this joke in Twitter, which is not in, a joke. Uh, you know about air raid sirens. So when Russia launched missiles, we receive an air raid siren, which is uh, which we call trivoga. Trivoga means like emergency, some kind of. Uh, and there is a map, digital map of Ukraine with regions, 
and those regions become like red because the air raid Syrians are on in this region. So depending where Russians send their missiles to, different regions become red. And if you watch the map, you see it's changing from red to, to green again. So the, the application for air raid Syrians was built on February 25th. It was available in all the app stores. Uh, and it's widely spread. And a couple of days later, the delivery services, like food delivery services, got synchronized with this application. So if you are ordering food from KFC, for example, and there is air raid Syrians ran in your city, your delivery will be paused during Syrian. And then, depending on the state, either you will get money back or the prayer will arrive a little bit later after air raid Syrians. So we are talking about this kind of uh, digital life here. And of course, uh, when many services are digitalized, everything can be broken, right? And this is why we're here. Yeah, but that is an amazing example, not only of the digitalization and using technology to, to, to actually uh, survive and and uh, try try your best to live normally during such situation. It's also a great example of fast response. So, one one day after after the missiles hit, you had the app. That's uh, that's impressive. Um, Chris, I understand uh, that you were already busy helping Ukraine before the 24th of February. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, certainly. So uh, part of my background is I've dealt with. Uh, one too many nuclear cyber attacks. And uh, one of the things I was asked to do was there was a fear that one of either in production or decommissioned um, nuclear facilities would get hit by a cyber attack. Um, uh, one of which uh, uh, in Chernobyl, uh, this had happened before, someone was able to hack the radiation sensor that showed online, and this was back in 2018, uh, pushing a false reading up. Uh, so those types of things can cause panic. Uh, not only that, but obviously if you're hitting an in-production uh, control system that's attached to a nuclear facility. So I ended up catching the very last Air France flight in on the 20th. Uh, all the rest of my flights were canceled, especially after the airport was kind of destroyed. Um, so I got to see some of the uh, cyber buildup and what was going on. Uh, so a bunch of ATM machines and banking logins uh, didn't function the way they were supposed to be. Uh, some were intermittent, some were denied uh, service for a while. Um, there were also hits against government websites in Ukraine. And while they were getting hit, uh, when I would hit refresh over and over again, I would also notice that a bunch of them started switching to Cloudflare uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so by the 21st, 22nd, a bunch of uh, government sites were then on Cloudflare, luckily. Um, there was also a cyber attack in Luhansk against the water infrastructure. Uh, which the Russians tried to turn around and use against Ukrainians saying, look at what they're doing to our people in Luhansk when it was absolutely untrue. So there were a lot of these like kind of false flag kind of events, but also related to cyber attacks. I mean, why would Ukraine want to take out all the water in Luhansk? There's no reason for it. Um, but, you know, media spins things. <clears throat> there were also uh, interruptions in some of the Ukrainian apps, and that was starting to happen right before the first bomb started to drop. And one thing to understand is some of these effects, if you want to buy something, how many of you have cash on you right now? Can I have a show of hands? How many of you have more than 200 euros on you cash? Really, I swear to God, I won't rob you. <laughs> Donations are welcome. Right. The reason I ask that is if you can, suddenly you can't take money out of an ATM machine or your Google Pay is disrupted or your regular way of paying is disrupted and you suddenly have to flee because there's shellings, you can see paratroopers in the sky, you hear about columns of tanks, um, you kind of need cash 
especially when the Russians were starting to disrupt internet service. And you're hosed if you don't have a bunch of cash, right? So it's a psychological thing where people start fearing what's going to happen if something really does. Um, so it, it's very upsetting uh, and it's something to think about. Um, so these things started building up and it was very funny where when uh, some of the cyber attacks uh, started to hit as well as it, one of the first uh, series of wiper attacks, uh, most Ukrainians in Kyiv that I spoke to were like, oh yeah, it's all cyber. We don't expect our electricity to stay on tonight because it was just expected that there would be cyber attacks against infrastructure. Um, so that's how normalized to a certain extent things had become when it shouldn't have been. You know, this is one of the problems where there, this war has been going on for quite some time and it's become so normalized. Uh, so um, I ended up having uh, a very interesting experience. I was in the Capitol uh, at the hotel that most of the international journalists were at, the Intercontinental. So I got over beers, lots of additional information and, and things of that nature that I might not have gotten elsewhere. And uh, when on the 23rd, uh, we had received a Pentagon briefing uh, saying that the Pentagon thought that uh, shelling would begin at 4 a.m. And of course, that's the last thing you want to hear when you're in a capital city. Uh, and you're hoping, hey, you know, there's just been a lot of media, maybe it won't happen, maybe it's, you know, what have you, because nobody really wants to get shelled. Uh, instead, on the 24th at 4 a.m., everybody got woken up. And I must add, since uh, the buildup from Monday the 21st, most people really weren't sleeping because things were already coming over the east. So here you're surviving on no sleep. You're thinking, oh, I just want to get a little sleep, and then boom. And uh, it's, it's not a pleasant thing. You know, how many of you have woken up to a fire alarm? A few. Now imagine a fire alarm times a million because you've just heard uh, shelling and you go to look out your window and the sun's starting to come up a little bit and you can already see columns of smoke. Um, so this was just not a pleasant experience. Uh, so I hope I, I set the stage uh, between me and Anastasia of how it was when the war for, first began. Thank you. Um, to continue on that note um, and, and, and help the audience here and online better understand the context, uh, Anastasia, could you tell us about your personal 24 hours around the morning of the 21st, uh, 24th of, of February. So uh, the previous night and, and, and the morning. What did you do? C can you walk us through, through your time then? First of all, I uh, totally agree with Chris. Uh, news were very disturbing for a couple of days already, right? And you remember there were news about um, the Russians will attack in February 16th which didn't happen, so everyone was like relaxed for a day, but then again, you start falling up. And yeah, many people didn't have enough sleep. Uh, and we were like, it's, it's some kind of very um, anxious and disturbing expectations of something you really, really, really don't want to happen. And part of your and the consciousness understand that there are real risks, but another part really tries, tries its best not to think about it. You know what I mean? And on February 23, I was working and I seen some friends in the evening and I got back at home and I continued working because uh, the news were pretty disturbing so I didn't I was not feeling relaxed I was not feeling ready to go to sleep I was working until I feel I will feel you know as tired that I will just go and sleep and I ended up like near 2 a.m. or something which I decided okay so it's February 24th 2 a.m. Kiev time I decided well enough let's go to sleep I um, I got into my pajamas and I tried to sleep, but I was scrolling Twitter, I was reading news. And it didn't actually help, because at some point they closed the, um, the air uh, 
the airplane space above Ukraine. And this was a sign we know really well from 2014. This is a sign of disaster. This is a sign of plane. This is a sign of shelling. This is a sign of missiles. So after this news, I was like, OK, it looks like something will happen tonight. And I didn't catch any any sleep at all. On some point, again, I was reading news and I seen this meeting in Aoun uh, and Putin saying something, something. And then my Twitter feed start saying that, hey, Putin has declared war. And I was like, well, maybe it's someone overreacting. But then this news continued to, you know, uh, the same news continued to repeat, and I was like, okay, looks like we are in real trouble right now. It was near 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Kiev time, and I got from the bed, no sleep, remember? And I, uh, I decided to finish packing my bag, because my bag was already prepacked. Because for months, months before February, all Ukrainian media, they were sharing the stories how to pack your panic bag. What do you need to have as a first aid kit? How to make sure that your shelters at your house are okay and safe? How much water do you need? And things like that, right? So it, it, it was not like out of the blue. So I decided to finish up, to finish packing my bags. And I was uh, like, Packing everything and near five in the morning, I heard first explosion. And first I was like, well, maybe it was something else. Who knows, Kyiv is a large city. Things happen during the night. But then I heard the second explosion. And I was super scared. Uh, I have so I wear my Apple Watch all the time. And later I've seen my heartbeat. And it was like, you know, 80, 80, 80, 180. Yeah, hearing missiles hitting your home city is not the best experience ever. So I finished to pack my bag really, really quickly. I called my mom. My mom was already packed because she was expecting something. And I told her, hey, mom, so this is Kyiv near 6 a.m. 5.30, 5.40, something like that. I called my mom and I told, hey, mom, please leave right now. Take your bags, take your dog, leave. Because the city will be jammed in hours. And the city was jammed. And then people who uh, were trying to leave later in the morning, around eight or nine, they stuck in a traffic jam. They could spend hours trying to get from the city. Kyiv is a huge city. It has like four million people, three and a half, including all the agglomeration. And it's situated in two banks of the river. So people who were trying to escape from another bank, they spent really hours in traffic jams in Kyiv. Right, so I told my mom to go and it was a wild decision. And then um, in my company, we were also prepared. So we had an evacuation plan, we had an evacuation point, and we just brought everyone in slack in 6 a.m. saying, hey, who is ready to go right now, gather here and here? And we waited until people start gathering, um, and we packed some food and some water, and we packed cars and we drove away in the morning of February 24th uh, in different, in, in couple of, in several groups, moving into different cities on the west side of Ukraine. And my group consisted of three cars, totally packed. People, cats, uh, children, bags, absolutely packed. And we were trying to find safe routes and to make now imagine millions of people are driving away, millions, right? The road had a jam as well. And we were trying to find routes not so jammed. At the same time, we have this column of cars. We cannot just, you know, drive away. We need to stay as a group. Uh, so in many cases, we 
took safest route instead of the quickest route. And one of these decisions led us into staying a traffic jam for 12 hours since 9 in the evening to 9 in the morning on the next day. We slept in the cars in a field end of February. It was not very warm, let's put it this way. Uh, but then we successfully moved to, to locations we wanted to move and again divided our groups and we start working on February 25th because as a security engineers we are involved into supporting some kind of critical infrastructure. And first our group was working on, on February 25th and they didn't have any weekends through March. Our second group, my group, uh, we went to the mountains. So Ukraine is a huge country and it has mountains, Carpathian mountains. We went to the Carpathian mountains, we find some kind of hotel. We created, we spent weekends building up the infrastructure, satellite internet, all these, you know, internal routers and things we need. And we, on Monday, Monday, February 28th, we were working as well. And when I say working, I don't necessarily mean working on commercial projects as a company, which we continued, but also doing working in terms of doing a lot of um, sudden help in security for other companies that become target of cyber attacks that needed to help with the data security. And then we were involved in many military related volunteering activities. And we stayed in this, we are still in this mode, right? It just, we did everything correctly for the first 24 hours. We evacuated almost everyone from Kyiv and from different cities as well. We regrouped, we created second office on the west part of Ukraine. And we continued our operations, you know, business as usual, plus missiles. Thank you. Yes, we would like to, to, to hear more, of course, uh, about the, the cyber operations, what you can tell us, what you can tell the audience and the Internet in, in a second. Uh, but, uh, Chris, uh, I understand you were also in uh, Kiev, where Anastasia was. And just for the context, to get from Kiev to the uh, western border of Ukraine, it's 500 kilometers. It's not, it's not super far. Ukraine is a large country, but 500 kilometers, which you can usually make in, 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 in some amount of hours, right? And as Anastasia mentioned, uh, her experience was, was in a traffic jam for, for 12 hours. And we, hear, we, we heard why, why, why that can be. Because the largest traffic jams that I experienced in some, of the, uh, in, in, in some of the bad countries with bad infrastructure are not 12 hours. But in war, of course, it's, it's really hard, which is also why Anastasia could, can't, can't join us here uh, physically today, because traffic is still uh, quite unpredictable. Uh, Chris, uh, how did your um, mission continue or changed after, after it became kinetic in Kiev? Uh, well, uh, so uh, I, we decided to uh, leave Ukraine and we saw that the traffic jams were building up. We had waited for some other people to evacuate, but unfortunately after loading them up, they panicked took all their luggage off and somehow thought that they were going to hitch a ride even though they were American and did not speak Ukrainian. So I don't actually know what happened to them, but it gave us time to uh, grab eight Romanians who had no idea how to get home because their employer uh, wouldn't answer their call when everything happened. Uh, so it, it worked out and we decided to go a southern route um, and over initially a bunch of farmer's roads and we actually got stuck in one of those roads in mud, but we were trying to avoid the traffic jams and also, as, as Anastasia said, take the safest route, not the shortest route. We wanted to uh, stay away from any sort of military targets. Uh, the first time we were gonna take a break, we had two vehicles, a sprinter bus and a car. So we had 26 people with us with kids. I'm not used to kids. They never let you sleep, um, but, uh, we were going to take a break uh, south of Kiev in, in one of the uh, next sort of biggest cities. And uh, I had had a Dutch friend uh, tracking me via GPS. And right when we were about to pull in, he goes, don't go to that town. Uh, bombing is imminent. 
And so we immediately turned right, and in less than a minute, they started shelling that entire town. Uh, so we would have walked right into a bunch of uh, shelling. And we drove for about, oh, I want to say 22 hours uh, the uh, first evening, going through these villages and so forth, finding out that the Wagner group had actually planted people in some of these villages, trying to set up checkpoints. We found propaganda leaflets, and I even took a picture of the truck that was dropping propaganda leaflets, which was inviting the Ukrainian people to welcome the Russians with open arms, um, which I, I think they underestimated uh, the Ukrainian people quite a bit. And we ended up uh, finding a hotel in the middle of nowhere, not usually open, but far away from everything, because we're hoping we wouldn't get bombed. Um, and then trying to go over the border. And uh, we chose the Syriet, Romanian border. And when we got there the next day, there was just a, a huge traffic jam. I think there was something like nine kilometers of traffic just to uh, get up to the border. And there were reasons for that. I found out later uh, on, I think the next day, uh, was that the Ukrainian border patrol had been hit by a wiper virus. So what's important to remember is um, uh, when you're trying to get over a border, Ukraine had an exit procedure, like many countries do. And they were also checking to make sure that you were eligible to leave, uh, if you weren't actively conscripted or not, if you're medical personnel, they wanted you to stay, if you were going with your children, they wanted to make sure that those children were actually yours, which is kind of a good idea, right? Um, but uh, again, if, if you're fleeing, not even though the Ukrainian government, like many governments say, hey, prepare, do this, do that, well, uh, many people were hoping it wouldn't happen and some did not prepare. So if suddenly your neighbor's house is on fire or part of your house has been blown apart, you might not have that go bag with your children's birth certificates or your passport or things like that. Um, so obviously the Ukrainian border patrol did not want to let anybody take children. Well, because of the wiper virus, uh, they were down to literally pencil and paper, only letting one car through. Uh, and so if you saw some of those pictures of uh, kilometers and kilometers of traffic along some of the borders, that's one of the reasons why it was slowed down. And it caused a humanitarian crisis in and of itself. Uh, at the border crossing that I was at, uh, one woman froze to death because she was, there was uh, two petrol stations, one on each side, and she was waiting in a very long line to use the bathroom, and it was very cold, uh, so she froze to death. I mean, we ended up sleeping in the Sprinter van. Again, the children did not let me sleep, but they're wonderful children, and uh, because they had already restricted the sale of petrol uh, when the war started, um, we could only keep uh, the heated seats on, for myself and Misha, we were uh, trading off driving while everybody else tried to sleep in the back, but we couldn't keep the heat on because we might not have enough fuel to make it if we had to stay any more days in that traffic jam. So we were fighting to make sure we had just enough heat uh, to stay awake and keep moving while everybody put together their jackets and slept in a big um, pile to try to keep warm uh, because we didn't want to die of hypothermia. Uh, so uh, it was very striking. Um, it, it might sound cool, but in reality it's not. I'm now the first person to discover a Geneva Convention violation through the use of cyber, and that was at the Ukrainian Border Patrol uh, when I went public with what happened. Sounds cool, but I've seen the human effects. People had to try to walk across the border because they didn't have enough fuel. There were mothers pushing babies. There were people in wheelchairs. There were people walk, barely walking through. And it was cold. It was snowy. It was icy. It was unpleasant. And because they could only process one car at a time or one person at a time, people lined up at the border. Luckily, when you got close enough, within half a kilometer, they tried to give people tea. But there was no place to sleep. Um, there was no place to keep warm and you were just standing there if you weren't in a car, uh, all because of malware or Russian wiper virus. Thank you for, for uh, that, sharing that experience with us. Um, Peter, what was the first thing that came into your mind when you heard about the missiles landing in Ukraine? Uh, what, what do you think? What do you feel? Um, 
Yeah, you saw an uprise of activities going on for weeks. Um, but yeah, I was bluntly naive to believe that Putin would be that stupid to make such uh, a move. Um, so you keep in mind that, yeah, he wouldn't be that stupid. Although uh, you see an uprise of troops on the border of Belarus, uh, Russia. Um, still remember <laughs> the day before the 24th, I had the positive COVID-19 uh, result. Um, so I felt already really shitty, like uh, if something happens, I'm bound to the house because of restrictions. Uh, and yeah, indeed it happened. Um, I saw it really quickly in the morning because I really slept well already for uh, weeks. Um, so when the first message is coming in that they're bombing Ukraine, uh, what you first do is uh, start uh, contacting people like Anastasia, uh, friends you know from the con, uh, friends you know from Ukraine, uh, how are their relatives doing? And for me, the, um, the days after were like that, uh, contacting if everybody's safe, uh, where, what is their position? Uh, what information can I get from them to the country or even get to save a part of the country? And yeah, that was for me the, the, the weeks after. But at most it was disbelief. How can uh, in, in 2022 um, such a world leader, well, we now consider to be an, a blood uh, dictator, um, can make such an action and can affect so many lives. Uh, for five million people are now displaced within Europe. Uh, that, 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 in the Netherlands, 17 million, that's one third of the, 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 and you can take other countries as well. That, 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 imagine yourself that, uh, like Anastasia described as well, that uh, you get the message that there are bombs dropping on your country and you have to grab as much as you can and you have to leave your house not knowing where you're going, not knowing to a country if you uh, can speak the language of um, how the weeks upcoming, even months upcoming. So my first concern in the weeks after were really uh, about people. Um, I got a request from uh, Professor from Kharkiv, can you please take care of uh, the, the daughter of my wife and his son? So we did. Um, then you get requests from people who are in the foster uh, of in the, in, in the, the homes as well. Uh, can you please assist them on, on, on legal matters? Uh, so my weeks after the, the, the war were really filled yeah, like that. Um, people first. So, yeah. okay. um, Anastasia, um, Chris previously mentioned uh, the attack on Border Patrol, of course. Uh, could, you, could you share the most uh, prominent attacks that, that you can share that uh, the Russians performed on the cyber infrastructure of Ukraine? And how did those attacks, if at all, change over the time of five months? Yeah, um, to talk about this, let's spend 30 seconds on my background. I'm a security engineer and I work in data security company, so we deal with cryptography. We do have our own open source, closed source solutions for data security, for, for encryption. And we often build um, security solutions that involve different kinds of encryption, anonymization, tokenization, secret communication, yada, 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 yada. So our experience is related really a lot to companies whose data was a target of cyber attacks, right? Um, for the first, the first months, we seen crazy things, how Russians attacked non-military targets, just simple commercial companies, just because, you know, because they can. I remember a call that lasted nine hours together with our engineers and the engineers trying to do incident response, trying to understand what was hacked, what data, like how data was corrupted, if there are backups, what should we do, how they should risk it up the infrastructure. Because we strongly advised, you know, to wipe the server and to set up a new one from scratch. We've seen attacks on, and these are not military-related companies. These are not critical infrastructure companies. These were companies with just funny names, 
some names were uh, related to some governmental services names. So it feels like people who attack those companies didn't really understand what they are attacking and why they are attacking. Uh, then we've seen companies that stopped operating in Russia, right? And they were trying to protect the infrastructure, they were trying to protect their data and their access from Russia geography, let's put it this way. And they were protecting, and they, for example, they have some servers, physical servers in Russia. So their goals were to protect those servers or maybe to use it as they are already physically located in Russia for some other purposes. Right? Then, as I mentioned previously, we do work with um, some critical infrastructure with OT, with operational, with, a, with hardware, telemetry kind of thing. So secure telemetry. And we spent really a lot of time for the first months to in rebuilding some security layers, some data protection layers of huge enterprise companies to make them more resilient for, for cyber attacks. And you might see that many Ukrainian companies switched to a cloud. So this, these first months, many companies did like emergency migrations. They migrated their infrastructure from physical servers located in Ukraine to fully cloud solution. And it, of course, brings all the security risks and all the zero trust approach we love a lot. But under pressure, missiles and the constant need to evacuate your family somewhere, right? Um, so regarding, uh, regarding the specific types of the attacks, what, what were the most prevalent cyber attack types that uh, companies experienced in Ukraine? I can't say that this was sophisticated cyber attack. Sometimes it was just a simple DOS, sometimes it was a simple malware, uh, wiping malware, for example. We've seen examples where um, someone had access to company's infrastructure and, the, and then just wiped part of database, you know, it, it's nothing sophisticated. So Sometimes are, uh, it was, yeah, a lot of defaces, and defaces typically masked other activities like data leakage, you know. So those were uh, mostly destructive cyber attacks then. Um, what do you think uh, were main goals of the cyber part of the Russian operation in Ukraine? Uh, I don't think that I'm a correct person to ask this question because you want me to think how Russian thinks and I don't want to no, do that. That makes um, it's even a matter of thinking in that. Yes, uh, let's open up the question. Any other panelists want to take that? Well, when you're in war and things that you rely on are disrupted, it also has a psychological effect on you. Uh, because one thing to understand is nowadays, uh, cyber, the use of digital technology, uh, has a huge psychological effect. I heard uh, one of my friends coined the phrase for misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and propaganda as psychological malware. Because that it really is what it is, right? If you want to shake someone's uh, spirit, you try to affect them in some way. Yeah, you saw a lot of misinformation, especially in the first days. Um, yeah, around what you described as well, um, that they that troops were surrendering, that uh, uh, the cities were already being taken, and yeah, later on it turned out to be all fake news. So, yeah, from that point of view, um, they took a lot of action into that, and it was well prepared. Yeah. Uh, for the counteroffensive, this is um, one of the uh, more interesting subtopics here, and I hope um, some of the panels will be able to, 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 to indicate something. So, from, I'm, I'm from Latvia myself, and where, where I'm from, we see that there are different hacker groups forming on both sides of, 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 of this war and doing different things. Uh, but from your experience, the three of you, um, is anything happening? 
how are they being organized, and uh, more importantly, or, or the peculiar question I have is, how do Ukrainians arrange it from a legal perspective, if, if at all? This is an open question for the panel as well. From legal perspective, um, yeah, I have mixed feelings about it. Because um, I am not aware, and, and <laughs> Chris next to me knows more about it as well, um, that if we as vigilant civilians take actions into our own hands, are disrupting operations that are already going on and are organized by uh, intelligence service or by military. So um, I'm kind of like double into this. On one hand, I think, yes, disrupt everything regarding Russia that is possible. But on the other hand, I also am aware, aware of the fact that uh, we have intelligence services that might be in or might take actions already. And then we are disrupting their work. So. Yeah, that's the double moral I have in this one. Well, I'll, I'll tell you some good news when it comes to this part of, we'll say, hacktivism uh, when it comes to trying to protect Ukraine. I was just in Geneva uh, at the UN the week before last, after a member where I travel. Sometimes I travel too much. And uh, as was pointed out from a uh, high-ranking official from the UN uh, towards the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Director of Information Security, who decided to show up and disrupt the uh, conference um, and had shouted at some people, uh, because this is how it works. It's because of Russia that there is no actual international definition of what cyber warfare is, and also Russia fought the UN on what uh, many countries and people believe are what are uh, referred to as international norms in cyberspace. Uh, so uh, it leaves this gray area open for people to actually try to help Ukraine um, and try to disrupt Russia, all because Russia wanted to be a bunch of assholes, I mean, I mean bad people. Um, so, uh, thanks Russia in some ways. Um, the person from Russia was not too thrilled uh, by the UN person from Estonia and yelled at her and called her some names in Russia and, and then left and caused an international incident. But it's of their own making. I too am um, kind of torn because I also think about the safety aspect. You know, it's one thing to deface a website or a distributed denial of service. Um, it's another thing if it were to cause uh, a loss of human life. And we are definitely, we have been at that point in cyber operations where you can actually do that. So I too have mixed feelings. I love the fact that uh, the Kremlin's website was completely defaced, um, but also uh, hope that it doesn't affect uh, civilians in Russia because there are some people in Russia uh, who do not agree with this war. And Russia can use anything that could affect safety um, in this respect as completely twisting it around and uh, unfortunately affecting the hearts and minds of some of those people who support Ukraine and Russia. Is there anything to add, Anastasia? Yeah, you know that uh, starting from February 25th, Probably one of the first days of full-scale invasion in Ukraine, we have a law that legally allows Ukrainians to kill occupiers without any legal consequences. There we go. So, do you accept Ukrainian citizens? Do you accept new citizens? You can come become a citizen twice for you. I think that's, that's one way to do it. Honestly, saying citizen thing is very complicated in Ukraine. So many people who actually want to receive Ukrainian citizens, they, it's very complicated to do. For, for now, maybe it will be easier. So, yeah. So we are seeing a lot of information leaks, especially in the, the five months, four months ago. Uh, we've seen that... Uh, information of Russian officers is being leaked almost every month. We've also seen some leaks um, from the Ukrainian side. Um, why and how do you think is that happening? Is that, are those hacktivists? Are those government officials, government official hackers? Is there a difference in this war between those two groups? Open question. I again. think yeah. that, yeah, let me 
than been here. I think that many people, especially Russians, believe that Ukraine has some centralized cybersecurity hierarchy. And uh, you remember one of the first days they hit the TV center in Kiev with missile. So hitting, assuming that we, if, we, if we hit TV center, the TV will be down, but all TV is digital satellite kind of thing, you know, so they just killed innocent people. They didn't actually disrupt its operations, maybe like for, how, for some hours. So the thing that there is no one single centralized knowing all cybersecurity structure in Ukraine. There are tons, dozens of groups that do something. Some of these groups are governmental and like created by government officials, like IT Army, for example, the huge Telegram channel, 200,000 people, right? Other groups are created by military organizations because military also has a structure. So intelligence, external internal intelligence, some different kind of military organizations, they have their own cyber units. They can create their own groups for their own operations, right? And there are people who just work in the field. There is security community. There are many, many people who want to feel involved the whole group together and do something. So it's a huge distributed mesh kind of system which has both pros and cons. It's very complicated to stop such structure because there is no single point of failure. At the same time, it's very complicated to control such structure. So yeah, and uh, since end of February, I believe that many uh, foreigners who wanted to impact the situation, they offered their help, and some of them continue working on different operations, right? So we cannot say that this structure is purely Ukrainian. No, it's not. It's a, it's a mix of things. And as in hacker movies, uh, often people don't know the names of other people they're working with. They might, know, they might not know the end target. They do some things, and they feel that they have impact on the situation, that they help in the country, and they don't need any money, they don't need any, you know, uh, put, they don't need putting their names onto this. They just put their time and efforts and skills. So I understand, uh, according to, to my knowledge, uh, both in the occupied parts of Ukraine and the, and the free parts of Ukraine, the internet is up and running, not flawlessly, but, but well enough. Um, open question once again to the whole panel. Why do you think that is? How, how does that work? And why is it allowed to work? Why is the internet up? Yeah, I, I have my, my own views on it. Uh, one of the reasons why I think that the internet was kind of allowed to stay up to a certain extent is because uh, Russia kind of enjoyed the fact that uh, people were documenting this war on social media. This is the first war that's really been documented all over the place on social media. So if you are sitting in Moldova, uh, and you are fearing that something's going to happen and you are seeing what's happening just over the border and you're like, you know, maybe we should, uh, you know, kind of fold uh, when it comes to Russia because we don't want uh, what's happening in the Ukraine and all the atrocities to happen here. I think it was very much, at least in my opinion, part of the reason was the psychological effect on neighboring countries, which also Russia has... Uh, either both threatened directly or has also launched various cyber attacks against. Any more comments on that part? It's very easy to destroy infrastructure with missiles, right? A couple of missiles in certain places and you can physically destroy part of infrastructure, but it might be not so easy to destroy these kind of state infrastructures with cyber attacks. What I also think is um, it, it, it's already since 2014 that this is going on. 
And, um, and if you look to the Ukraine situation, um, I can imagine myself that they were prepared for such an event coming. So their infrastructure was already on a certain level prepared to such an invasion, I think. Um, so yeah, that's what I consider to be the reason why it's still up and running yeah. there. So uh, four days ago, uh, the occupiers have uh, started blocking Google services in uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, any thoughts of that in relation to the, the internet being available in general? What's their goal there? Control the narrative. Uh, Russia also uh, instituted a fine against Google in Russia uh, because it was serving up Google news that the Kremlin did not agree with. So if you can control the flow of information and only uh, push your agenda, because there's no more free media uh, inside Russia. There's none. Uh, the last uh, channel ended just after the start of the war. So control the narrative. There is this great paper that was written by um, a guy at a Dutch university. I'm terrible with names, can't remember it for the life of me, but it is called The Dictator's Guide to the Internet. It's about 20 some, 30 some pages, uh, double spaced, and it is a playbook about 10, 11 years old uh, about how dictators can control the internet. I highly recommend it. It has a weird URL, but it really is uh, that, um, but the uh, dictator's guide to the internet, and it's almost like a playbook of uh, shutting down certain services, controlling the media, allowing your version of social media to stay up while blocking out other forums such as Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, fun fact, several years ago, Rush actually made LinkedIn illegal. So to uh, communicate with some of my friends who worked at Kaspersky, I had to set up a special email account just for our communications because Signal also didn't work and a few other things. So it, it really follows that guide. Um, so those can be so, some of the reasons to control that narrative. Yeah, and it's easier to do when you have occupied the territory. My point is that cyber attacks have limited scope on such huge infrastructure as internet, as mobile network, as critical infrastructure. But when you have missiles or you, you are physically on this territory, you can do more things. Yeah, that's why I really like the initiative of Squad 303. I presume we, um, yeah, my co-fellows here on the table know them as well. Uh, it was an, it is a service where you can uh, send people in Russia information like, hey, you know what is going on. And um, I did it as well, and I had some really interesting conversations. Uh, most of them swearing at me like, yeah, <laughs> you're just a Nazi culprit or whatever. But I also had a couple of conversations where people actually said that, yes, uh, we are aware of the situation and we are organizing ourselves. And of course, the truth of is yeah, hard to determine, but yet still this little yeah, hope you have within Russian society that uh, some bright mind maybe yeah, take up some action against the current dictatorship going on there. But that is a really nice action to uh, start a conversation from human to human. Yep. Uh, there's no mm -hmm. lot of tech involved in that. Everyone can do it. You can even ask your mom to do that. And it generates automatically a message, use Google Translate, and try to get the, yeah, get them in, in a conversation with them. So that's. Now, before we move to the final part uh, of the panel, when, where we talk about what should happen next and how can we help further, um, a question for this part of the panel. On the cyber front, do you think Russians have achieved their goals so far? No, and it never will be. <laughs> yeah, everyone agrees. OK. The <laughs> no, they're, 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 easy and sweet yeah, answer. No, you already see that, that the, the, the first stage of uh, the reason why they started this war was a quick move towards Kiev. Yeah. And um, on everything they failed. Uh, and, and that has many military several reasons for that. Uh, logistics, uh, corruption. Uh, 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 material, um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the strongness of the Ukrainian army, because after 2014, after Yanukovych completely ripped that army, um, the army was completely rebuilt, 
and mm -hmm. uh, also according to uh, uh, modern standards. I'm not going to address it, <laughs> but um, yeah, th 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 he made a fatal mistake that he could overrun, and, and you see that as well. Uh, he was also misled. You see, around Putin, a couple of intelligence officers were uh, detained, ended up uh, uh, being falling out of balconies and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, that happens the, in Russia. Yeah. Sorry, the, it, that happens in Russia. Yeah, that, that, uh, the, the Russian tradition. But um, on that, you can indicate as well that Putin was completely misled into this war. But now he stepped in, and now what you see in the, in the past few months that destruction is his only goal. Destruct as much of Ukraine as you can, because his real fear is not. Uh, Ukraine as a country, not Ukraine as a member of the European Union, not Ukraine as a NATO member. No, the success of Ukraine is Putin's biggest fear, because then Russians see what happens to Ukraine can also happen to us. Yep. No, I, I agree. I mean, definitely he underestimated uh, Ukrainian farmers uh, picking up uh, tanks and uh, towing them away. Um, but uh, also he was surrounded by a lot of yes men. I mean, if you're around Putin, you'd kind of be afraid of being around Putin anyway. Uh, and I think more people have died falling out of balconies who uh, are government officials and of COVID at this point. Um, so I don't think it has achieved the goals that they intended. Uh, they had intended, for example, to uh, strike fear and to uh, some countries as well. And that hasn't quite worked out um, in Georgia. Uh, there's uh, one of these areas it's they kind of refer to as breakaway South Otessa and uh, just before a new leader was voted in the now previous leader said we're going to have a referendum and join Russia and right before the referendum a new leader was voted in and they're like no we don't want to be part of Russia we're, we're, we're fine the way we are um, because you know what Russia's not gonna have our back Russia's not gonna be able to pay for stuff um, they're, they're hosed. So this idea that certain, you know, Russian enclaves or former Soviet countries would kind of bow down to Russia uh, isn't happening. And so I think that's also proof positive between that and the spirit of the Ukrainians that is ongoing uh, proves that Russia has not reached its goals. Thank goodness they haven't. Chris, you touched international aspects here. So uh, Peter, you would be a good person to... Um State your opinion on what do you think Ukraine needs internationally moving forward? Um, I was in Lviv in the beginning of June. Um, I've met up, of course, Nancy. We drank yeah, coffee. <laughs> um, and I've spoken to the guy we handed over the medical gear, Mikhailo. And I asked Mikhailo as well what does Ukraine, beside weapons, need uh, after the war? And plain answer was knowledge. Knowledge how you construct your societies, knowledge how you construct your uh, governmental organization, uh, knowledge on, on how the rule of law in your country works. Um, and in order to make, uh, I think we should yeah, rebuild Ukraine after this even stronger, even better than before, to make sure that such a brutal action never will be accepted by the free and liberal society in the, the Western world. We won't let this happen. We promised ourselves after 45, this will never happen again. And we should stick to that uh, promise, no matter what. And um, yeah, from that perspective, I think, and uh, especially for people here in the room, um, yeah, I think we should support Ukraine with whatever we can. Whatever you can do to make this turn into a better outcome for Ukraine, do it. So what, what should Ukraine do after they win the war? Make sure they never come again. <laughs> um, yeah, b build a real freaking wall uh, on, on, on the Russian uh, Ukrainian border as high as it can. Uh, because yeah, they will come again. And, um, and yeah, become resilient, become stronger than ever before, and with the help of of, of uh, yeah all the the, the 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 civilized countries, I think we can yeah mm -hmm. get them reach that goal. Any more thoughts on that in the panel? 
Uh, I think a, a couple of other things are going to be required, such as tech diplomacy. I think this is a real good opportunity uh, from the digital world to rebuild things. Uh, to give you some background, a lot of farming equipment uh, is still made in uh, Belarus, and that was one of the places that a lot of Ukrainian farmers would buy their gear because it was less expensive than, say, uh, a Caterpillar tractor or something like that in the U.S. Um, so looking at cybersecurity portion, definitely. Looking at the laws, like you mentioned, uh, especially in regards to privacy, uh, because a lot of the uh, data leaks have been done to try to get you know, surveillance and information on people. Uh, looking at agricultural technology, because a lot of the fields have been really badly burned and destroyed, so they're going to have to be redone, so uh, more efficient uh, agriculture is going to be needed. Uh, Ukraine has for a very long time been the breadbasket of Europe, and now it's also the breadbasket of Africa and parts of Asia, now that's been disrupted. So they'll need... Um, much more modern uh, farming techniques and a way to cut off uh, farming supplies and agricultural supplies from Belarus completely for the next season. Uh, and it also gives this opportunity to uh, even add more digitization where required uh, because uh, the Russians will not stop. I mean, if you look back in history, uh, I remember when my grandmother uh, and her family had to leave, they had to live through a famine in the 1930s in Ukraine, and then uh, when World War II happened, uh, so they uh, went to the U.S. Um, but since then, uh, we have a real opportunity to make Ukraine a powerhouse. And Ukraine has, for quite a few years, already been used as a lower cost center for a lot of developers, programmers, and a lot of digital technology already. So uh, there's a good amount of knowledge in that realm there as well. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, helping uh, with all of my friends, Anastasia, uh, Peter, uh, everyone else, uh, making sure that uh, Ukraine is even better than uh, we are right now in the Netherlands, uh, because Russia is never going to just stop at Ukraine. Yeah, I agree. And I think that every extreme situation, it requires some extreme efforts, right? And many people in Ukraine in different industries, including cybersecurity, right now they gain very unique experience unfortunately but they gain a very unique experience that after the war can be used you know for better goals for for improvements for collaboration with different companies for collaboration with different countries to create something more valuable because what we see right now is a mix at least from my standpoint is it is a mix of digital and real world and how it will all, it all work together. Yeah, right now it all works together in a military context for our victory. But in few months, in few years, this can lead to, you know, normal, normal usages, peaceful time usages, because unfortunately every war is, has impulse to create something new, some new technology, to build something after war, right? So my final question for all the panelists is, what did you learn during these five months that can be applicable in peacetime? Are there any best practices that you can share with us? Uh, freedom is not for free. I think the biggest mistake um, the, 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 the NATO slash Western European countries made was that uh, after the fall of the wall, we thought that we could cut budgets on all, uh, and especially uh, if I look to, uh, not for the United States, but especially the Western European countries, they cut it on budgets for defense. And we now see the impact. We don't have a, uh, a military answer to such a geopolitical situation. Um, that should be for what I consider to be the, 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 uh, the Western European countries, the lessons learned, invest in your defense uh, systems, invest in uh, uh, knowledgeable soldiers to react 
in such uh, situations. Um, and, and, and that's why I say freedom is not for free. Uh, yes, you never hope you will have to use your military interaction, but uh, in such a situation, you rather want to have them well-trained, well-equipped to act on such brutal actions as uh, this dictator is now showing to over Europe. And um, yeah, what I learned as well is that um, under pressure, everything to become fluid. Uh, we saw a lot of legislation uh, because, um, for example, Ukrainians were allowed to travel into the uh, European Union to um, be a, a, a tourist. And because of the situation and the urgent situation at the Polish border, um, we could arrange so quick, so uh, magnificent um, care for people that I think that uh, if we really want uh, stuff to happen, it will happen. As long as you, you believe in the core values that you have. And uh, that's something I also learned that uh, if you really want, you can do it. Thank you. Chris? Well, um, I think some of the things that uh, can be made better, uh, like Peter, I was also trying to help a lot of people evacuate, especially some of the international students or elderly or handicapped or folks who are the most vulnerable who were unfortunately the most difficult to get out. And I ran into a lot of governments and their embassies who gave such bad tech advice that they either got people killed or were about to get their own citizens killed. Um, and this is a problem around the world, uh, but shockingly uh, quite frequent in the Western world, where they don't understand uh, how to actually write policy and talk to technologists like us. And if they do write policy, it's not implementable. Uh, so understanding things. I remember when I was trying to get over the border with our convoy, I was speaking with someone from the US State Department, and it turns out she didn't know how to use WhatsApp when I was trying to send a list of uh, passports and identification for another convoy filled with elderly people, many of which had either dementia or uh, diabetes and needed to make sure they had some sort of medication and carers. Can you imagine during a war, somebody who works for US State Department doesn't understand how to use WhatsApp? Uh, mind was blown. I actually had to hang up with her because I was so angry. Um, so a lot of governments also have to understand that uh, that psychological malware that I spoke about before, why it's so important to build countermeasures and groups and actually take it seriously. Because we've seen even in the UK where Brexit kind of was skewed a little bit uh, and they're already finding links between Russian money and so forth. So these types of things need to be taken seriously. And I think this is one thing that the uh, war has taught us is if we are still standing in an analog shadow during a war that is also fought on the digital front, we are going to fail miserably. So I think that's one thing that should be learned. Right, Anastasia. Well, as a, um, as a citizen, I would say that I learned that citizenship is not only rights, but responsibilities, right? That's why I'm here in Ukraine. Because as a citizen, I have responsibility and I have unique skills and an opportunity. As a person, I learned that if I survive all of this, I will be unstoppable. I mean, literally, if I can do these crazy things I'm doing right now, under constant stream of bad news, physical missiles and calling my relatives to learn if they're still alive. I can do anything. As many Ukrainians right now, yeah, we will probably need some break to, you know, to sleep, to regain, <laughs> to, like, to feel less tired after the war, after our victory, but then they're going to be unstoppable in anything. Thank you. This is um, inspirational words coming from you here. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, uh, Peter van der Howell from Saxion. Thank you, Chris Becker from Hypersec. And thank you very much, Anastasia Wojtova from Cossack Labs. I've been Kirill Stelovyovs from uh, Possible Security. Thank you very much for coming here. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini.